welcome to The Spawn Chunks, episode number 293 for Monday, April 15th, 2024. This is a podcast all about Minecraft, available across all major podcast platforms, including YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, consider subscribing wherever you're listening to this. My name is Johnny, but the internet knows me as Pixorus, and joining me as always is a heavily backed up Joel Duggan. Hi, Joel. (laughs) <laughs> that, that, that sounds so wrong yeah we're no, gonna move I, right on real I, quick <laughs> i heard it i heard it and thought maybe i should do a different one but no like we're, it's relevant to what we've been talking about in the render distance and that's that's the rule digital backup digital backup folks get your mind into the gutter <laughs> we were talking about pc woes pc goes or pc not goes uh, in the render distance, which is the extended version of the podcast and the importance of backing up your files, having some hardware redundancy in your studio when you are a creator or just an avid Minecraft player. Things like saving your world someplace other than the PC that you play on is always a good idea. And you can check that out by going to patreon.com slash the spawn chunks, which is where you get access to the render distance, as well as other benefits like being here for the live recording on Monday mornings. You get to do the quarterly hangouts and monthly Minecraft hangouts when we have those. The next monthly Minecraft hangout is coming up, I believe, on the 27th of April. That's usually the last Saturday of the month. And because of our lovely patrons, we have unlocked a cool monthly perk called the Junk Mail Dispenser. That's this week. That's where instead of the main discussion, we answer more emails in the show than normal. So you can look forward to that later today. Yes. Um, So if anyone's confused about why I sound slightly different, that's also relevant to what we've been discussing in the render distance. I'm having some PC issues and I'm actually using my partner's setup, which has a different microphone. So uh, if you're at all confused about why the audio suddenly sounds a little different, don't worry. Uh, It should all be back to normal relatively soon. But as far as our quick login goes, those PC issues have kind of stifled my attempts to get anywhere in Minecraft this week. Um, I've had intermittent crashing issues which have made it a little difficult to get anything done and the dig on SOS is the only thing that I've really been able to continue. I'm now saving a few chunks of it for a friendly contest between server mates in future once a few people are uh, back from trips and things like that. I should hopefully have got enough progress done that we can just have a bunch of the, uh, the, the, the chunks all carved out at once and that should be the end of the dig process. Um, so I'm saving a few chunks for that um while my pc is away being repaired a backup machine is arriving and i was saying in the render distance i do have a backup of the survival guide world now so i should be able to continue that series alongside minecraft sos my backup plan if i didn't have the survival guide world backed up was doing a snapshot mini series where i attempt to clobber everything in the game with a mace i might still do that because the mace is honestly uh, really quite fun to use and having had a, a fun conversation with Ulraf last week, I'm honestly feeling pretty excited about the mace in general and want to get a bit more experience with it before I start carving up the survival guide world and, and deleting chunks of terrain that I haven't used just in case they have trial chambers in and just in case I can acquire a mace from one of those. Um, but really, I don't have a whole lot to share this week on the quick login, so I'm going to hand it over to you, Joel. Uh, what's new on the Citadel? So I revisited the Crossroads sign briefly before I moved on to a new project this week. And uh, I liked what I did with the arrow and the armor statues data pack where I had had a uh, armor stand holding an arrow pointing towards West Hill. And I thought I'd try to do a little bit more with the other hanging signs and finish them up a little bit. And so I added a poppy to the inn sign. I added a soul lantern to the east road sign and i added a spruce sapling to the west road sign because that's where the taiga biome is in the region i might have overdone it i'm i left them up i didn't do both sides i just kind of thought well let's try this out see what it looks like and it worked out pretty well from a stylized standpoint though i was using some unicode symbols to have arrows instead of having an armor stand for everything i didn't want to overdo it And I found a couple of very cartoony looking arrows that fit kind of like the Minecraft style. Problem is they only point right. Oh, so (laughs) okay. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So you can't, which which makes sense because like a lot of characters in terms of, you know, Western typefaces, they, we read left to right. So the arrows don't very often point left. And if I did find a left pointing arrow, it wasn't very good looking. Sometimes it was only like one pixel wide, really didn't jive with what I had going on. So I might come up with some other ideas. I might not put a symbol on every sign. 
I might just go with a couple just to kind of make them feel more important. But it did add some life to the to the signage. I thought it was fun in, in that way. Uh, and then right next to that actually is what I've been working on. I started a new project uh, called the Lilac Farmstead. This is one of the farms that borders the crossroads and it's actually pretty key in terms of the player experience walking into West Hill. Uh, you pass a wheat field and a potato field and then there's an empty field and a couple of empty patches of grass. And so this field is going to be filled with lilacs, which is a very bright pink flower and is adding a lot of color to the countryside. And because of the way that I've got them set up uh, in tiers and offset in rows, uh, you don't really ever look straight down a row and see like nothing. It's always like you only see about five or six blocks of, of a path and then there's more lilacs up on the next tier. And so I'm going to be combining that with some complementary crops. I have a custom texture on my beetroots. My beetroots look more like traditional beets that you might find in real life. And so they have kind of like that magenta uh, pinky look to them. They're not exactly like a lilac. They're more magenta, but they match quite well. So I'm going to be putting those higher up on the hill. I do want to work in some pitcher plants because I think that they work well with the farmhouse, with like the, which is pretty gray and then the the bright kind of like purple and pink in the lilacs but I, i'm on the fence because pitcher plants are darker than i had them in my mind and so i planted a few i'm waiting for them to grow up that's the problem with the pitcher plants is that you gotta wait for them like crops once you have them you have them but when you're starting new you have to wait for them to grow up and in doing so i reminded myself i really wish that we had the ability to stop crops mid-growth in the same way that we can stop vines from going by yeah. right clicking with the shears and, and shearing them and not just for for pitcher plants because pitcher plants have this great sort of like combo of like they look like a turnip then they look like a giant carrot and mm -hmm. then then they have another phase that's kind of darker but you, like you just you can't do anything about it unless you want to put string on top of the third phase and even then like good luck because it's just going to, especially with a shader screenshot, you're going to see string everywhere. And it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Yeah. You might be able to put like a, a roof on it if you had it in like greenhouse maybe, but outside it's not really going to pass. But I would love to even be able to do that with wheat. Like it would be nice if you could have the second or third stage of wheat and snip it so that it looks like the garden is in the process of growing in some places as yeah. opposed to being full grown all the time. Um, I had toyed around with using ferns and too tall grass as like, greener crops that haven't maybe matured yet i still might do that but overall i feel like the lilacs looked the best uh, and then i moved on to the house and the lesson that i'm learning from these kind of plots that i've been working on is that i started laying out the lilac field then i realized before i get too close to the top of this i really want to figure out where exactly the house is going to be what are the grounds around the house going to be like so I've been working kind of both in the house, outside the house, and on the grounds kind of all at the same time. So it's very much a work in progress. I can't really point to the field or the house or the inside and say it's done. It's got a first pass. The palette is chosen. The design is, is good. I like the scale of it. It's not too big. It's squat, so it doesn't feel too tall for a farmhouse, but it has sufficient detail without making it feel fancy. And I wanted it to make sure that it felt kind of not cobbled together, but certainly that it was made from immediate materials, not like fancy stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's come together pretty well. I've got a deep slate tile roof trim and and uh, andesite walls. Like it's not fancy. Uh, it was hard to make it not look like everything else in the region. But I think with the, the timber uh supports and stuff it's it's working out pretty well so i'm looking forward to doing the inside of that and having those details and uh i do have some extra work outside where i want to put in some flower beds and some small vegetable gardens that would be not necessarily like growing for the region but just like your own personal potatoes and carrots and things that you might have in your backyard if you were a farmer so that's all coming and um, i think it does a good chunk of immersion as you're walking into west hill now from the north you you see this farm there's a tree that kind of goes by there's um the the house on the hill that you can't really see at first and then oh wait there there it is you see it when you come around the corner so all that kind of stuff i think is working out pretty well yeah i i like this i i am i'm with you on wanting to like trim plants with shears and i'm trying to think mm. in my head of like exactly why you can't 
do that with plants. Like in terms of the way vines currently work, the glowberry vines uh, and, and so on. And I think it's because they have that age mechanic, right? Which a lot of crops and other plants do. Um, they've got like different stages of aging. I think even saplings have that to a lesser extent. But I think the thing is, what it does is if you right click on it with shears, it just turns that plant into the maximum age, right? Or, right. or something yeah. like that. So that so that it doesn't continue growing from there. So doing applying the same like train of thought to something like wheat, it would just instantly grow it if you right clicked it with shears because the last stage right. looks different. And so I think that's that's where the kind of holdup is. But I would honestly love to see more stuff like that in terms of customization i think it might be a little awkward for a a new player experience or casual players maybe walking around kind of snipping the wheat and stuff and then forgetting that they had done it and wondering why that particular patch of wheat didn't grow or whatever right but but i I do like the idea of being able to stall something's growth just for aesthetic reasons and i agree with you the pitcher plants are a really solid candidate for that because of that bulbous like turnip looking uh starter stage that they all have so I wouldn't mind seeing stuff like that in future if they decide to add that to the uh, the list of potential quality of life changes for builders. Well, especially with things like saplings, like that gives you a whole bunch of different bush type things that you could plant without having to worry about it growing into a tree. You yes. know, like you could yeah. put down, you know, uh, uh, any sapling that you thought felt right for the situation, snip it. And then it's not going to grow up. And you could either then put a bush on top of it to kind of make it look like a shrub. You could just leave it on its own own little thing. You could put several of them together to create what looks like maybe a tree nursery. That kind of thing could be fun. Um, But yeah, I just, it's, I know that the other thing that they haven't done yet is uh, regular vines. So the old vanilla vines that you get, uh, those, they're controlled by a command. It's, It's a game rule where you can turn off their spread. And you can still spread them with bone meal, but they won't spread on their own, which is great for builders because then you can just put them where you want them and they're not going to like grow over your door <laughs> and yeah. you don't have to have string everywhere to keep them from moving around. And so that's cool. Um, but it's a different mechanic than snipping it with shears, right? So it's, it's, I think it's because of the way that they're coated versus the way that new vines are coated. And also that's a different thing because the original vines, they go on walls and they do hang down, but they have to go on a, a, a vertical surface first. Whereas the uh, glowberries vines, like that, you have to put them on the underside of something first. Yeah. And yeah. then they go grow straight down. Or what's the one in the, 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 the warped vines and weeping twisting vines? vines? I think are the weeping. It's, yeah. It's weeping with the crimson biome and then twisting for twisting, the, uh, right. the warped biome. Yeah. Yeah. Same idea that so they're they're more of a. Uh, a block object i know they don't look like a block but they 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 take up a block space yes in the same way that a flower does and and i think that that's that's why they you know they can work like that same with kelp same with kelp so, yeah yeah um, Vi- vines have a lot more in common with ladders than they do with like the yeah <laughs> the, true. The, the glowberry plants right so there's there's yeah. uh yeah, a lot of a lot of differences to be found there, but yeah, like this looks like it's coming along really nicely. I, I always love the the aesthetic of anything that you put in this area now. That sort of like a build on its own outside of town really adds life to the area and makes you think, oh yeah, that's absolutely how people would live their lives. There would be some people who can't live within the city limits because they're needed out there in the fields, or you know, they're they they've sort of lived there for a while and the town has grown up in the meantime. And yeah, I think it it makes it make perfect sense. It's like driving out in the countryside here in the UK. And and seeing those sort of occasional farmhouses just kind of out on their own in the countryside. It's uh, it's something that makes perfect sense to me when I see this in-game. Thanks, man. And uh, pro tip, if you want to have some really good screenshots for your farm, spend three years building a town behind it. <laughs> yes, that's the pro <laughs> tip for, uh, for today. If anybody has the time to spend, then yeah, absolutely. Um, it's time to move on into the news for this week. We have a Java Edition 1.20.5 pre-release at long last. Pre-release 1 came out earlier last week, and to quote the article, it is now time for the first pre-release of Minecraft 1.20.5, featuring some tweaks to Trial Chambers and Ominous Trials, as well as new advancements, a big set of technical tweaks and changes, and lots of bug fixes. From now on, you should mostly see bugs being fixed. In addition to that, pre-releases don't follow the regular snapshot cadence of releasing on Wednesdays, so keep an eye out for the next pre-release. 
experimental features in 1.20.5 pre-1, trial chambers are more consistently buried by terrain when found underground. They've remade Chamber 6 with variations. It's now got the formal name Assembly. They've added a new trap dispenser style to chambers, fixed various broken jigsaw connections in the corridors, and made a couple of tweaks to the eruption chamber. Uh, they've stopped tough bricks from spawning in the air and added more lights to quadrants. Ominous Trials have also seen a bit of modification. Mobs that can wear equipment will now often spawn with enchanted weapons and armor. Armor enchantments include Protection 4, Projectile Protection 4, and Fire Protection 4. Weapon enchantments are a little bit less. They include Sharpness 1, Knockback 1, Power 1, and Punch 1. In addition to that, mobs that wear equipment no longer have a chance to drop their equipment on death, so no easy Protection 4 Diamond Helmets for you. Players are now chosen 50% of the time when an ominous trial spawner chooses which entity to drop projectiles on top of, and projectiles will now spawn more accurately above their chosen entities. The three new potion effects have also had a couple of tweaks. The weaving effect now more consistently spawns two to three cobwebs on death. Players are now affected by the movement buff through cobwebs. You can move through them with 50% of your normal speed instead of 25%. The oozing effect will only spawn slimes in a given 5x5x5 area up to the maximum entity cramming count. And the infested effect now has a 10% chance to spawn 1-2 to two silverfish instead of a 5% chance. Silverfish will now spawn at the centre of the entity's bounding box and fling out in the direction the entity is facing. In addition to that, an advancement has been added for the experimental features, revolting, where you unlock an ominous vault with an ominous trial key. In 1.20.5 Pre-1 new features, the stuff that's actually arriving in the 1.20.5 update instead of experiments for 1.21, they've added a few new advancements. Isn't it Scute for getting armadillo scutes from an armadillo using a brush? Snippet for removing wolf armor from a wolf using shears? Good as new, repairing a damaged wolf armor using armadillo scutes? And the whole pack for taming one of each wolf variant. A couple of changes in 1.20.5 Pre-1, they've added support for the Viosa language, and in technical changes, the datapack version is now 39. This has added new item sub-predicates and loot functions, added a new terrain adaptation type for structures called Encapsulate, where density will be added all around every piece of a structure, ideal for structures that need to be entirely covered underground. The page limit in written books has been removed, and there are a whole bunch of other technical changes, too numerous and crunchy to be listed here, so you can check out the minecraft.net changelog for more, that is linked in our show notes. The notable bug fixes in 1.20.5 Pre-1, there are some old ones, like not being able to trigger flying mode in creative while you're in the middle of a 2x2 magma block bubble column. The anger time and angry at could not be set on summon for mobs like zombie piglins that pack aggro at players. And Ghast Fibles and Wind Charges could not be redirected in melee if the attack that redirected them did zero damage. There are also some new fixes, like Wind Burst books being available from Villager Trading or obtainable in the enchantment table when they should be a treasure enchant. Mace Smash attacks can be done multiple times from a single fall, and entities with the infested effect could spawn silverfish without actually being hurt. Those are just a handful of the bug fixes, as the changelog says. There are a lot of bug fixes in this one, so you can read those at the Minecraft.net changelog linked in our show notes. Minecraft on YouTube put out a short last week with five new paintings that are now available on the Bedrock Beta and Preview, coming to Java Edition soon. The new paintings are 4x4 Programmer Art, 2x2 Minecraft Gothic, a spin on American Gothic by Grant Ward, but with villagers. A 2x2 Cake Decorated Pot and Sunflower. A 2x1 Player Riding a Horse. And a 1x1 Rose. And let's talk about those first, actually. I'm really excited to see new paintings. I actually looked it up when the, uh, the short and the uh, Bedrock Beta came out, and the last painting added to Survival Minecraft was the Wither painting, which debuted back in 1.4.2 when the Wither itself was added. Uh, for those of you counting, it's been 12 years <laughs> since we had any new paintings in this game, give or take the ones that were the elemental ones, the sort of earth, air, fire, water ones, which I think were part of Bedrock Edition, weren't obtainable in survival. I think they were meant to be added as part of a custom map back in the day, and they just sort of lingered in the code, and those were recently added to Java, but behind the scenes, so you can't 
spawn those in except with commands. They won't show up in the standard rotation of paintings. So it's a really big deal somehow that we're getting a few new paintings in the next version. And they're nice paintings. They're actually things that you may want to put in either because it's a jokey take on American Gothic or because the rose painting, which is my favorite, is just really nice and going to be something that you can use in a number of different situations depending on on how you want to, you know, decorate your your builds. And one of the reasons why I I don't bother with paintings, especially in, in interior builds, is because most of them I thought were just either ugly or dumb. And they didn't feel like they matched like what I wanted to do. Like a really good example. I think there was a Donkey Kong one at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like stuff like that. You're just like, well, I, th- it doesn't, it's fine if it's kind of a joke, but like it, it doesn't really suit most of what you're going to be doing out of your own imagination in, in Minecraft. And I ended up, as I think a lot of other people ended up um, doing custom painting texture packs, resource packs. I actually uh, have a friend, uh, Brit, who's an artist, and I, I asked her, and I used some of her paintings from Instagram, and I've, I've got them around the modern city, and it all, it's all Brit's art, and it, it works because it's very modern, kind of abstract. It, it works great for reducing to pixel, um, art in, in Minecraft. So there are definitely things that you can do, and I, it would be nice to have more of these things revisited. Some of them I can see staying, like the Wither, but there are definitely some paintings that there's like a giant skull with a candle that just it's it's also huge you know it just it doesn't really vibe with how minecraft has developed i think over the last what do you say 10 to 12 years yeah yeah 12 years i think since 1.4 so yeah that it's been (laughs) it's been a while yeah it's great that they're doing it i think it's I, i hope to see more i hope to see more either options or I don't necessarily know if they will ever remove the old ones because I feel like sometimes Minecraft clings to these things because they're legacy. Um, I could see them maybe putting the old painting textures into the programmer art texture pack mm-hmm. and then and then having some new modern ones that look a little bit nicer in a newer resource pack, the more modern resource pack. Um, I'd like to see that, but I, I'd like to see them do more, uh, especially if there's any kind of painting that they could add that would reflect a new update. So if there's something key about 1.21, like the trial chambers, the breeze, um, anything to do with copper, like I just, I feel like you could add a painting that would go well with whatever the update is. Um, a dog, you know, one of the new wolves would be nice too. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, <laughs> there are plenty of like, you know, Renaissance era paintings of dogs, if anyone wanted like some inspiration and they have clearly taken inspiration from these, from existing art i mean yeah american gothic is is one of those um apparently the horse riding one is sort of loosely based on frederick remington's the cowboy um the still life is just kind of baroque painting in general and then um where's the other one there's there's a couple of them i'm looking at the uh, the minecraft wiki i i think um the rose is meant to be based on a dali painting um, okay. So, so there's there's like little references within them to the world of art in you know the real world, but I like the mix of kind of tributes to real life art and these sort of subtle references to the game's own culture. Like the the larger four by four one is packed up PNG. It's the icon that you see as a default before you load up a world and it takes a screenshot of whatever you see when you logged in, and so it's it's really kind of cool to see references to that not least because that was made infamous more recently by players in the community trying to find the seed that that came from from back in like the beta days of minecraft or whenever it was generated um the fact that the rose is in a painting now but was replaced by the poppy back in the day when the flowers were all redone and now we have rose bushes but we don't have single roses because poppies are the the red flower and so there's like little references back to the past of minecraft which is perfect sub uh like um a, a perfect subject for paintings like this i think it's it's really quite clever I, I like the programmer art as well because it's got that nod to Minecraft's history, but it also just works as a painting. Like yeah, it looks like a, a picture of the yeah. you know, mine, Minecraft landscape, right? You know, um, in terms of other paintings, uh, wolves playing poker, I'm calling it. Now. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be really fun. <laughs> so a couple of things to pull out of the 1.20. 0.5 pre-1 changelog. Uh, I actually looked into this because I was curious what Viosa was, not a language I had heard of, and that's because it's a conlang, it's a constructed language. 
um, begun in 2014 by a Skype community, which I think now works through Discord. And I was reading up a little bit about this on, on Reddit and a couple of other places the community had posted to kind of share their work. And it's a language that is supposed to be more intuitive. There are no inherent grammatical rules to like if you write a sentence in it regardless of which way around the words are you're supposed to effectively understand what the speaker is saying and anybody who's new to the community they treat it as though you are getting sort of immersed in the culture you can sort of ask loosely what certain words mean and they'll translate them for you but you're supposed to learn just through context and through explanations that either take place visually instead of verbally in a different language or um you you get the explanation in viosa and you have to kind of start to intuit it so like they're, they're really sort of strict about new people coming in but not to the extent that they make it unapproachable to people it's much more like these are the rules for how we interact with people and like making sure that whilst they are there they are constantly trying to learn and so that's that's a really interesting community to look into if anybody's interested in that. Uh, the fact that it's su supported by Minecraft, na Minecraft now feels kind of trivial in a sense, but to the people who are involved in this and for it being effectively their 10-year anniversary, probably quite a fun thing, probably quite a big deal. So uh, congrats to them, I guess. I, yeah, I mean, it all sounds like a, a cool thing to me. I, I wasn't uh, aware of it until just now uh, in reading your little notes before the show and, and looking over the notes for the, the update. But um, I'm also glad that we're getting, you know, 1.25 soon for folks that are, are champing at the bit for it. Me, uh, I think it's, it's mostly because I'm curious to see how the data pack changes are going to go down. Uh, every time there's uh, either a, a snapshot or a pre-release now, they seem to up the version of the data pack as they march forward with the new is it predicates and item data i can't remember exactly the yeah. terms yeah and so for me on the citadel and for the rest of the players on the citadel which, i mean there's only a half dozen of us um we're not going to be jumping into 1.20.5 right away we only just updated to 1.20.4 and so i'm hoping that the time between dot five and 21 will be enough time for mod authors and data pack authors to catch up yeah. and either update or have alternatives available for players that want to continue with their customized, you know, mods and, and, and data packs and things like that. Cause there are definitely some things about the data packs that I would like to keep on the Citadel. Um, certainly a lot of things that make life easier, not so much like, yes, I like the tables and chairs to stay, but it's more about like the custom recipes and some of the little things that we've got going on, like crafting string into wool, like all those little things, I think that really kind of make life a little bit easier on the Citadel. I, I'd like to try and, and keep those. Um, but I'm also thinking about the new features, you know, that are, that are getting flushed out and they're making subtle changes to things like, um, the, um, the mobs and the wolves and the, the scoots and the, uh, the achievements and things like that. And while I won't be bringing villagers into West Hill, cause that would drive me bananas. I have thought about bringing in the odd cat or maybe getting one of the new wolf variants once we actually have for us it'll be 1.21 um because the white wolves are pretty bright but like getting one of the darker wolf variants as like a stray dog or something in west hill would be pretty cool i wouldn't want him walking around i'd probably have him sitting outside of a house but it would add some life i think because you know they'll blink and they'll look at you when they when you walk by that kind of stuff so that could be kind of fun but um i i don't know outside of the um forefront features of 1.20.5 with the armadillos and the wolves and the things that we know about the under the hood stuff it's still a little over my head like I, i'm not quite sure how it's going to affect the game i'm kind of waiting to see once it lands how are things going to develop further and are there going to be some data packs and some things that were possible before that are either not possible anymore or not possible in the way that they were written in the past and they have to be completely reimagined and is that going to be a good thing like is it going to open up more opportunities or is it going to be easier to apply is it going to open up opportunities for mod authors who otherwise wouldn't before but maybe it's going to be more accessible to people i don't know I, I, I if you are a member of the community that is involved in that kind of stuff and you know by all means drop us a line it's a spun chunk mail at gmail.com and it would be great to hear from either a mod author or a data pack author about about these changes 
Absolutely, yeah. Um, looking at the Minecraft wiki article for 1.20.5, it's just armadillo scute wolf armor, armadillo wolf variants, and then a page as long as your arm or longer <laughs> about yeah. commands and, and, and item formatting and how all of that stuff is changing. So yeah, I expect with them obviously having snapshotted this well ahead and effectively delaying what might have been an earlier release for 1.20.5 so that the community has time to catch up with all of the item component changes, I think it's hopefully given people enough time to figure out what's going on, if not exactly how they're going to change their data packs to match. It should be relatively straightforward. Um, and personally, yeah, I'm glad we're getting 1.20.5 soon. As somebody who you know, isn't really going to be affected by any data pack related stuff and I'll just be able to update the survival guide world right away. I'm actually really interested in covering the features that are relevant to survival gameplay. Um, having armadillos around, having wolf variants and wolf armor. I haven't done much with wolves in the survival guide season three at all, despite considering them more of an early game thing. So I think it's going to be a good incentive to go out there, especially with advancements, kind of tracking your progress and teaching you how to do some of those mechanics. I think it's kind of nice that those exist to sort of prompt players to investigate the new mechanics because they're not really going to make themselves too obvious in the way that terrain changes or a new structure would. But once they encounter an armadillo or a wolf of a different variant, they might suddenly realize that there's more to the update than meets the eye. Since I know you're a fan of the mace, how do you feel about the changes to trial chambers and those encounters being harder with the ominous effects? Honestly, I'm fine with it. I was surprised that the ominous trials seemed to flow as easily as the regular trials did. When I, I went in on a snapshot world with no armor or anything kind of spawned in, I kind of salvaged equipment as I went and, and got to sort of diamond equipment level pretty quickly. Um, and just hopped straight into a trial chamber, and the only thing I really found a challenge was managing food. Um, so, like, in terms of gearing up and going in there, you're going to want more of a challenge from Ominous Trials if you're intentionally going out to look for a trial chamber. So I think it's a good thing that they've decided to up the ante a little bit with mobs having better equipment. But I think it's pretty well balanced. I think mobs are going to take a few extra hits to kill if they've got protection for on their armor, but the weapon enchantments aren't really much worse than you get from the average like enchanted sword on a zombie piglin, let's say. So I think right. it's it's honestly going to be a pretty even match for players who are expecting to go in there and get geared up for it. And then, of course, you have the players who will completely strip out a trial chamber and turn it into a series of farms, and at that point, they're not going to have to worry about it anymore. So I think that's solid. I think that they are they are good changes. I think the effects changes also seem good. We were worried previously about the weaving effect not spawning enough cobwebs um, and now they're spawning two or three cobwebs more consistently than just one at a time so you can actually use that as a legit cobweb farm now um, I think that's that's good and the oozing effect makes sense because slime farms had the potential to turn into incredibly laggy uh, setups if you had a ton of entities all spawning slimes at once I think sticking it to the um the entity cramming count makes a lot of sense because I think by default that's something like 24. So you're still going to get a bunch of slimes spawning and they're all going to be like medium-sized slimes anyway. So you'll have plenty of stuff to work with. It's still going to, you know, it's, it's still going to look pretty impressive when that happens to a larger group, but it's not just going to be completely game-breaking in terms of uh, farms that are going to exploit those mechanics. I think it's pretty, be pretty well balanced as a result of that change. I am curious to see what the oozing effect changes will have on potential alternative slime farms in the future too. It's going to involve more, but like that's just more gameplay, you know, instead of just digging holes and finding slime chunks, if you are able to find slime on your own through just luck of the draw, just enough to make uh, an oozing potion, then a mob farm is all you need to get mm -hmm. going. And as long as you can collect enough that you can make another oozing potion, and and maintain that status quo just like saplings right like as long as you can get more saplings than the trees that you cut down you're good yeah it's and, sustainable and, uh, after that point yeah. yeah yeah so i think that that could be could be interesting and it's not one of those things like is it going to be the most efficient probably not is it going to be more fun maybe yeah. you know is it going to be or, or for people that have been you know like their fourth or fifth or hundredth time starting a, a minecraft world this time i'm going to do a potion slime farm just for the challenge for something new and different and you know time to stretch your gameplay legs and just find different ways to do things 
yeah, there will always be a meta, there'll always be like the most effective way to do stuff, but I like it when we get more options for farming stuff like slime. So I think that's a uh, a perfect thing to to change about this uh, this upcoming update. Um, let's move on into chunk mail, which is going to be the bulk of the rest of the episode. If you'd like to email the show, the email address is spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. And episode 300 is fast approaching. As you may have heard in recent episodes, we are planning an all Q&A episode to celebrate the milestone of reaching episode 300. To try and include as many members of the community as possible, please send in a one-sentence question about anything you would like to ask me and Joel. It's the kind of thing that we're thinking about, like getting to know us in the similar way to the patrons who listen to the render distance and get to hear like stories from our life and whatnot so if you want to send in questions about minecraft then that's fine but if you want to ask us questions about our history with podcasting and other video games what we get inspiration from real life experiences and that kind of stuff obviously keep them fun we'll have a whole range of questions that we're going to be uh, answering on that episode so really looking forward to doing that one if you're emailing in make sure you add 300 q and a to the subject line of your email so they can be easily organized for the show and once again keep those one sentence questions coming in to spawnchunkmail at gmail.com our first email is from jan g mud and quicksand hi joel and pixel Rips. in a recent episode you talked about converting skeletons into the bog i wondered why there's no wet mud quote unquote block that works like powdered snow Maybe this wet block could convert skeletons into the bog. Take it a step farther, and maybe a new quicksand block in deserts could work in a similar fashion and convert zombies into husks. What do you think? Jan accidentally fell into mud while building an automated poison arrow farm. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not sure why you want an automated poison arrow farm in the first place, but I guess poison probably has a better effect than slowness, which is what you get from the strays. And I've always been slightly mystified as to why people want uh, slowness arrows other than just to have them, just because you can farm things, right? Um, right. And I, I can easily see something like wet mud and and quicksand being added in future, but there's a couple of things I wonder about this. First of all, I wonder if Mojang would be a little cautious about adding too many trap blocks in surface environments. And I say this because like players, especially like from my own experience, are already in the habit of avoiding powder snow rather than either like going through it and dealing with it or, you know, wearing leather boots in certain areas and swapping those in and out so that you can have the the ease of being able to uh, move through and, and over powder snow. Um, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if adding quicksands to deserts or bogs to swamps just ended up feeling like a punishment to players who wanted to explore rather than a mechanic that was really that useful if they just mechanically have the same purpose as powder snow then i feel like mojang has less incentive to add them and so you'd sort of want them to do something a bit different with that um i also think that yeah the conversion mechanic makes sense but like converting mobs only becomes beneficial if they drop something different and that even then the benefit is negligible like like i said you can you can get hold of tipped arrows in a variety of different ways and i'm never entirely certain why people want to use uh slowness tipped arrows so when when bringing up husks as an example like i don't know about you joel i don't find husks any kind of use because they don't drop anything different right do you ever really seek out husks in in your worlds no, that's what I was confused about the emails. It's like, well, it's a it's a neat idea in terms of the consistency with sinking blocks. And like, I can see how, you know, that mechanic could make sense to a player that might come across it. If you've sunk into sand, then when you sink into powdered snow, you'd probably know, okay, well, I know what to do here. Not panic, either dig myself out or next time I'm in the area, wear some some leather boots. Uh, but I, I don't know what you would want a husk for in the same way that I don't know what you would want poison arrows for. Like, you know, just, there's not a lot. When I think about the bog, I do think about a, a, a potential way to make a mushroom farm. Like if you could shear the bog and get the mushrooms from them again, not the most efficient way to do it, but it could be fun in terms of shearing skeletons just because maybe you don't like skeletons and you want to give them a haircut. I don't know, but there's things like that that I could see being useful, but the, the husk thing didn't make any sense to me. And I thought that while it is consistent to have a couple of ideas for new sinking blocks in the game, I I don't think that it would be as entertaining or as interesting for players because 
if they added something like, uh, well, I mean, they've already added mud. And I think that what they've done with mud makes a lot of sense. It slows the player down. You do sink a little bit below it, the surface of it. But what I like about it is that it's another block that you can use over a hopper to to bring items in mm -hmm. and not have to worry about it being a slab or getting a hopper minecart. So it has a different functionality than, say, Powdered Snow. And uh, Powdered Snow has had some other functions in terms of redstone, like aligning items or slowing the fall of something if you don't want it to take full damage and like all that kind of stuff. So there's different things like that. And if they added anything like quicksand or an additional wet mud block, then I'd want them to have a new mechanic, you know, something that would be like similar to, I guess, the the description, like quicksand. Sure, you you maybe would want it to work sort of like quicksand, but is it like Minecraft's version of quicksand? Why does it have to be the real world? Like maybe quicksand could be like water and like move things around, but with sand. I don't know. You know, quicksand is then something that you can bring into the nether because it doesn't evaporate, but it works like water. I don't know. There's just, there's a bunch of different things that I think would be way more interesting than just turning zombies into husks. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I think players are looking for the transformation thing because you can already turn husks into zombies and then zombies into drowned. And it seems logical to want the reverse to be possible, but that, that's sort of regardless of its utility. Like it doesn't, there's no real need to dry out a drowned to turn it back into a regular zombie. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's, I think, some merit to the idea of having stuff like quicksand and, and wet mud or yeah, some sort of bog block. But if you want it to emulate real life as well, powder snow is something that you can fall into and the snow maybe compacts underneath you as you fall through it. But you can still kind of get stuck in there pretty easily. Whereas with quicksand and muddy bogs, typically the general advice is as long as you don't struggle too much, you're only going to sink into it up to roughly your center of gravity. And so players, if that was emulated in Minecraft, would only sink like waist deep into it and then wouldn't really have to worry about it. Maybe it's a, a block that only, kind of like how berry bushes only damage you when you're moving. Maybe if you try and move through it, you sink. But if you stand still you don't and perhaps that's part of how players avoid sinking mm. into it or maybe that can be another mechanic i'm just trying to think what that could be useful for but in the same way that we have you know honey blocks that you can slide down and those end up being useful for player elevators as well there are potentially some some neat uses for it that i'm just not seeing from a, a theoretical perspective our next email comes in from shenko with the subject of ominous difficulty good day johnny and joel what do you think about ominous events being applied to all structures in Minecraft? Maybe that means more hostile mobs spawning in nether fortresses or skulk shriekers summoning the warden in ancient cities after only one strike instead of three. We'd love to hear your implementation ideas. Shenko drank too many ominous potions and was consumed by darkness. I don't know exactly how to implement these changes, but the idea of opt-in harder challenges, I think, is a great solution for players that want more of a challenge out of a PvE experience without forcing those challenges on other players. But to echo the conversation we had with Ulraf last week, the trick is to not make the reward of those challenges so enticing for all players that even those not interested in PvE or those hard challenges feel like they have to partake. Uh, the challenge is there to keep all the rewards probably PvE. So like the mace is a big PvE weapon. And if that's what you want, great, go for the challenge. And if like me, maybe the mace doesn't interest you so much, then you're not gonna really deal with the ominous trials. But that means that all of the rewards for all of these challenges would have to be PvE related or PvP related. And so then the game becomes really heavy in that in that area and less so in other options. So I, I don't know how you balance that. Like, it's just kind of like a, a roadblock that I came to when I was thinking about this. Um, I do sort of like the idea of alternatives. So right now to get a beacon, you have to find wither skeletons, kill them, get the skulls, get the wither, um, summon it and kill it to get the nether star. And if you had an ominous nether fortress experience, and if that was an alternative way to get the nether star instead of fighting the wither, because I know that the wither is something that some players just don't want to deal with. And that could be an interesting way to provide an alternative for th the same reward, which is the, the beacon, the ability to make a, make a beacon. And it 
would tie in because like you'd, you'd be getting pr presumably harder or more numerous wither skeletons to fight you know in in a in another fortress so it, it would take a lot of balancing but i i think the main idea that i like here is what mojang has done with the ominous potion and making it an opt-in effect and so hey these things exist as part of the game as part of the progression and if you've done that and you want them to be harder here's how and i think it makes a lot of sense to take that ominous potion and now an existing or will be an existing thing in the game and apply it to new things rolling forward and they don't have to be applied to everything all at once you know the next time there's another update the next time that there's you know or if there is ever an end update having an ominous um end city experience could be really interesting i'm not sure what a hulk out shulker would look like but you never know <laughs> <laughs> they they grow arms and legs and start walking around shulker 2.0 has entered the game um yeah no i i like the vault i can see ominous events being added to new structures rather than old ones and i think it's really because the new the, the old stuff hasn't been designed with mechanics like this in mind so retrofitting it becomes a little bit difficult like it it's it's not quite a fresh coat of paint it's how can we use the environment for a set of mechanics that it wasn't originally designed for and raids are flexible in that they they have a specific way that they try to spawn mobs but as long as the terrain around is standard the raids always going to spawn in like fairly randomized locations the waves will come in from all different sides and it only really changes that when you restrict the area in which stuff like that can spawn but effectively it's a wave survival challenge and i like the idea of expanding ominous events but only if they escalate the challenge in an interesting way uh sort of the way when raids were added in 1.14 it was unlike any other experience we'd had because there wasn't a mechanic that spawned multiple waves of mobs outside of something predictable like a a zombie spawner or whatever right um so so raids really feel like a natural part of this and likewise the trial spawners being enhanced by the omen effect are really just providing enhanced mobs and unique loot but that's also the stepping stone to unlocking more features of the structure in the form of like ominous vaults and getting slightly different loot out of the trial spawners i think that's more interesting than something like just increasing the mob cap in a nether fortress so that more stuff spawned there um you'd have to modify a lot of mechanics to make all of that stuff rush in towards the player in the way that like waves of a raid do and it's difficult to imagine a win condition that doesn't just turn this into a nether version of a raid and just kind of reskin the same mechanics i think the nether fortress idea would likely just become a requirement for some high yield with a skeleton farms you know it's like the new level of the meta once you have your right. with a skeleton farm you chug a potion and it spawns skeletons 50 percent more of the time or whatever um and so i i think a lot of the time those mechanics are just going to end up being exploited more so than feel like a unique experience for players and throwing out a couple of ideas for how they could transform nether mobs like magma cubes could spawn a stage larger than the maximum size which we know is a thing in the game's code for slimes and i think magma cubes so there's there's options for stuff like that you could have blazes throwing soul fire instead of regular fire so to do more damage but obviously that's based a lot more on what block the fire is set on currently than it is on what's causing the fire so obviously that would have to be kind of retooled slightly and you know maybe the wither effect lasts a little bit longer or something like that so that there are a few little tweaks that could be made to make things more difficult but ultimately for what reward is is the the major question you know how do you then make the nether fortress an intrinsic part of the experience that this couldn't just be something you threw anywhere in the game like how does it feel unique for the nether fortress um the same goes for any other structures like i can't imagine ominous desert temples really being a thing because the desert temple experience is currently so brief for players who know the deal there um I, I can't see it really changing a whole lot um and so i think it's a lot easier to plan for ominous events being a new structure thing because you can design them with that in right in mind rather than feeling like you have to stick an old a, a new engine in an old car <laughs> you know um that that's sort of my my two cents on it i i think it's it's a cool idea in principle 
but it sort of speaks to why they implemented something like trial chambers instead of just completely overhauling dungeon spawners is that some of these newer ideas don't always apply to the way old structures were created in the first place i think the trial chamber as a new structure is designed really well to lend itself to ominous trials yeah like the the layout the the fact that there's different spawners the keys like all of it really works well together i think that there'd have to be a new structure some sort of other thing not maybe not a trial chamber i'm not sure what they would call it you know like a new thing added to the nether it's not a it's not a nether fortress it's a it's a different thing you know a nether chamber for the lack of a better word right now and and that would be a structure similar to how piglin bastions are very different to to nether fortresses right if it was a new structure that was geared towards this kind of experience i could see that maybe being a thing but i i like you i feel like retrofitting older experiences run the risk of either changing old mechanics um removing old meta um removing the early game experiences for people going to the nether and go, like that that onboarding things are gradually getting harder sort of thing uh, i think that it would be better to move forward rather than retrofit the the older stuff um i i could maybe see a use for it in something like an ocean monument where maybe you've killed all the elder guardians but you want to respawn them again and maybe an ominous potion could do that uh, because of the fact that right now they drop armor trim i can't remember which one uh, they, the tide armor that. trim and and sponges that's the sponges. other thing is like yeah. being, being able to create a sponge farm using ominous potions admittedly that'd be one potion for three sponges so it wouldn't be a yeah. huge trade-off but like i do like the idea of making sponge renewable that sounds pretty enticing to me yeah and it wouldn't be easy and it's not afkable you know you'd still have to do the work so i i think that that could be interesting and i mean I've only ever cleared one ocean monument. I can't say I'd want it to be harder than it already was. <laughs> so sure, yeah. uh, that's that's kind of where I stand. But uh, yeah. I, yeah, I think there are some potential. Yeah, I think bastions are one of those things in the nether that you can see making an ominous trial out of, but the difficulty there is that there's four variants of them. So if anything, it would have to be four different trials or something very generic that didn't really feel suited to the environment. And that's where I the, the idea starts to fall apart for me. Like, it's a cool idea in principle, and I, I want to see them do more with effects like a general kind of bad omen branching into different variants. That's the really exciting part of it for me. Uh, but I don't know if the old structures in the game are really there to be retrofit with these ideas. I think it's much more exciting for them to create something new. Our third email comes from Captain Kramer, Enchanted Overhaul. Hello, Johnny and Joel. While listening to your discussion about enchantment table tweaks on episode 287, I thought, I wish the enchantment table had gatekeeping. Now, hear me out. <laughs> Gamers hear the term gatekeeping and immediately cringe but when was the last time either of you enchanted something with 14 levels when was the last time you were psyched about efficiency three looting one or feather falling two i feel for new players the enchantment setup is confusing beyond measure i feel like enchanting is worse for veteran players we get to level 30 enchant one thing hope we get lucky and then start the process over it always seems like more of a chore than a reward for doing something fun or exciting. In a game that can be speed run in 10 minutes, progression-based gatekeeping wouldn't make much sense. What if enchantment progression was skill-based? Chop 100 logs and efficiency 1 is unlocked. Kill 200 mobs and sharpness 3 is unlocked. Just something to give the enchantment minigame a sense of progression. Then again, I have no idea how something like this could be communicated to new players do you two have any thoughts? Captain Kramer died of boredom, endlessly grinding for the elusive silk touch enchantment. <laughs> I think we've all been there. Uh, <laughs> definitely me in in uh, Minecraft SOS with my streak of having, I think, seven or eight Fortune 3 pickaxes come up when I really wanted silk touch so that I could stop smelting all of the cobblestone back into regular stone. So yeah, I, I feel you there. I like the idea of the progression-based enchantments and... I don't know how easy it would be to track, especially because the game tracks like how many skeletons you've killed, but not like benchmarking. Like it's not say that you don't get rewards or any, you know, flags for 200, 300, 400, that kind of thing. Uh, but what I was thinking of is 
similar to how some of the profession tables have those visual markers that indicate, oh, this is where a template would go, like an armor template. It would be neat if the enchantment table had an additional slot that had an outline for things that you might want to combine. So instead of tracking mob kills, player would need to bring drops or a stack of drops to create that po that enchantment effect. So feathers or a phantom membrane for feather falling, spider eyes for bane of anthropods, like that kind of thing. So you have to go collect like the sacrifice, I guess, you know, do the work to say like, hey, I've killed enough spiders. Now I feel like I should be really good at killing spiders. And that's how you get the, the bane of anthropods. Um, I hesitate to say bring some sort of enchanting template as it adds another long list of items to the game because of all the enchants that you'd have to get. Um, but exploring for the ability to lock in an enchantment, I think is, is good. Like I, I feel like they want people to explore the world more rather than just stay in one spot. Um, I don't know how you would key in the system in that way. Uh, I think that if you do anything to the enchantment table setup, I feel like keeping the original RNG, even though people don't particularly like it, it still needs to be there, I think, for very early, immediate kind of like learning how to enchant. And if you haven't done any exploring and you just have the enchantment table, then like being able to get something, I think is better than nothing. So I think it's a good place to start. And I think that when you have, I don't want to call them shortcuts, but when you have a guarantee of, I will now get this elusive silk touch enchantment because I was able to collect this many cobwebs to, to summon this enchantment. Um, it doesn't mean anything if it was hard, it wasn't hard to get in the first place, right? So if it wasn't something that you had to try and get through RNG, then the reward of getting it immediately means nothing. And so I think that there still has to be that original RNG in there. Um, I'll give a shout out as well to uh, data glitch who wrote in with a very similar idea around using rune stones uh, around the enchantment table. We had a number of people write in about changes and thoughts on enchantment. Yeah, it's it's an idea that's been around for a while, like having a catalyst of some kind in the enchanting process. Uh, we had a member of our Spawn Chunks community ages ago, who I don't know if they support the podcast still, but um, they were talking about developing a mod that allowed for like a catalyst to be used in the enchanting process so that you could have a better idea, a better chance of getting certain enchantments. And it, it makes sense. I think, going back to Captain Kramer's email if you're building the enchanting system from the ground up, if there wasn't an enchanting system already and you wanted this kind of skill progression system in the game, then that would be a cool alternative, but it, it feels more like a general skill tree than an enchanting system uh, with the way you've described it. I think retrofitting something like this to current Minecraft worlds would kind of feel like a nerf for players who are used to the current system because skipping straight to efficiency four is much more valuable to newer uh, to, to to veteran players than it is to newer players because you know what's required to hit certain thresholds like you can't instamine dirt with a diamond shovel until you have efficiency three you can't instamine grass until you have efficiency four and you can't instamine stone until you have the beacon and you have efficiency five and so I think there are certain thresholds that experienced players want to meet, but they don't want to go through all of the pain of having to grind a thousand stone before they can unlock efficiency two. And then at that point, what happens to combining enchantments? You know, like, can you then go through the grind of, well, I've only got access to efficiency one, but then I can still combine those in an anvil to get efficiency two. And suddenly the grind becomes about getting 16 books so that you can have efficiency five <laughs> you know like yeah it, th there's there's a few things like again i love the idea in principle but there are a few things that this completely throws out of whack to the point where it only really makes sense if that's the first system you implemented before we had all of the enchanting and stuff that we do now like for example how do you balance villager trading if you have a like a fixed progression for you have to kill a hundred mobs before you get access to sharpness one. Okay, great. What do villagers trade you? Do they only trade you sharpness one? Do the books level up as you do? Or can villagers give you that shortcut? At which point, villager trading becomes immensely more valuable. The other question is, 
once you've unlocked all of the enchantments, do you always get the best ones? Because despite the example they gave, yes, I haven't really been in the mood to get, you know, looting one lately. But what if I've got a looting one book that I found in a chest somewhere and I want to upgrade that to looting two so I can combine that with a sword that already has looting two and get looting three? Like, sometimes you do want those lower level enchantments and... Honestly, the only other way I can think of around it if the enchanting table is always giving you the best stuff is to breed villagers for low-level books, which sounds like even more of a chore than re-rolling them for efficiency 5 is currently. Uh, so I think there are there are good ideas here, and I love the idea of some sort of skill-based progression in Minecraft in general, but you're also going to find that players like Joel and I, for example, we probably want decent enchantments on our swords from the get-go because we don't want to do the combat side of the game. And because sharpness 5 on a sword is going to mean that if we are forced into a combat situation, we can deal with it as quickly and effectively as possible because it's not a side of the game that we especially enjoy. And we're back to Ulraf's argument, which you brought up in the last couple of discussions, which is, you know, if you are forcing players down a certain avenue of gameplay that they don't like in order to just get some basic results and get that out of the way so that they can have the goal at the end, then people aren't going to enjoy the game as much because the sandbox element is really what they're here for. Um, so yeah, again, I, I like the thinking that's gone into this, but it doesn't feel like the kind of system that's going to work for Minecraft 15 years on, you know? I agree. And in my experience, a couple of things just kind of came to mind. One, my inventory pinch means I don't carry a sword, a bow, or arrows. So I attack things with an axe. Right. Because yeah. I, I need that for wood chopping, and the sword just kind of sticks in my <laughs> in my chest. I grab the bow sometimes when there's a lot of creepers around, but like I, I just don't carry them around that much because I I just use what I have on me because I want that one extra slot. And I can't remember the last time I enchanted something like all of this works for people that are restarting the game frequently or for new players. If you're someone like me, that's been playing in the same world for seven years. Like once I got a uh, mending and uh netherite, like I, I barely even think about my tools every now and again, I've got to go get them mended at, at the, the gold farm that we have in the nether, but that that's it. I don't, I think the last time I had to enchant something was like two years ago. And that's because I lost, like I died. I, you know, I hit a tree or I did something and I lost something over lava that wasn't netherite. Uh, and I had to go and re-enchant it. And I, even then I'm pretty sure I used our super old school villager library and just used books to get it back up to speed. Yeah. Um, but like you said, I was grabbing whatever books we had, you know, like if we had two efficiency four books that were expensive, didn't care. I just bought those, combined them. And that's what I did. You know, just, I just wanted, I just wanted to get it done. So I didn't have to think about it again. <laughs> you know, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a fun experience. Even without the enchantment table, I was d dealing with villagers and I was just like, I don't really particularly enjoy this part of the game. I just want to get it over with because yeah. I want to just be uh worry free or just be at the and even then it wasn't like i want to be the most efficient at fighting things off it was like i want to be the most efficient in stripping wood <laughs> and yeah. chopping down trees whereas the last time i enchanted something was probably thursday and <laughs> with with minecraft <laughs> sos needing all of these pickaxes and stuff and and avoiding using mending i haven't like super optimized my gear but i need efficiency five every time and I wanted to get started on that digging project straight away because I knew the scale of it and how long it was going to take. So I feel like having to grind up through like chopping down a thousand trees just so I could have access to efficiency four. I feel like that would be a, a deal breaker for me. So, yeah, I, I'm kind of glad that the system like this doesn't exist yet. But again, I like the idea of skill based progression and it could be something applied to the game in a completely different way. But it needs a fresh system instead of retrofitting it to one that we already have. Uh, moving on to Dragon Dan 135s email. This one is all about villager trading buffs. Hey guys, was listening to your conversation with Mogswamp and got an idea for the villager trading rebalance in the works. What if there was an advancement around the world in 80 chunks where you trade with, say, three different villager types, plains, snowy, and savannah, for example? Every other villager recognizes that you're a friend and gives you a permanent discount. Trade with all villager types, and everything is one to two emeralds. I think this will help incentivize people to explore and trade with all villagers without locking trades to being biome specific. It also gives another way to get discounts without converting villagers to and from zombie villagers. Thoughts? Dragon Dan 135 traded with all of the villagers around him and got everything he needed safely. 
I'm not sure if I completely understand where Dragon Dan is coming from, because if you have to trade with three different types of villagers to unlock being a friend, you'd still tie those to biomes, right? Which doesn't help super fat players. But maybe it wasn't the focus of the idea in the first place. But I just I'm a little confused by unlocking trades for all biomes if you still have to travel to three different biomes to to get them. Um, I know that you didn't have to hit all of them, but one of the other ideas in the email was trading with all villager types to bring everything down to one to two emeralds. And so I, d I don't know how that really balances things. Adding the advancement to suggest the players to travel and trade makes sense though. Like I think that that is a good way. And we're seeing that more as Minecraft adds new features. There's always a host of advancements that suggest to the player that you're going to have to travel to, to go do this. You know, you're going to have to gather all the different um wolf types you know befriend all the different wolf types for certain advancement suggesting to a player that might not know oh there's other wolf types i didn't know <laughs> you know so that kind of stuff i think is is good and i don't bring up the advancements very often but it seems like a really good way to indicate to players that there is something that you might not know in the game and to go seek it out and le learn something new i think the issue that i have is that there's nothing really in the game outside of the little toasts in the top right hand side that suggests to you that there is an advancement screen i guess you have to explore the options page so there's nothing in the game that like that happens that says like oh hey in this tutorial we're going to walk you through the advancements yeah um, that i remember anyway like correct me if i'm wrong uh to address trading every with everyone uh i like the spirit of it but bringing everything down to one to two emeralds this is kind of a hot take but I think finding ways to permanently get trades down to one to two emeralds or the opposite, finding ways to get more emeralds than you're ever going to need, regardless of the price of the trades, defeats the whole idea of trading. <laughs> yeah, it kind of does. Like, I'm, I'm sort of with you there. I don't have an alternate to suggest. I just, I'm just a, in that stage where I don't want to build a raid farm. I don't want to walk around everywhere to get super low trades. I don't want to take my villagers and turn them into zombie villagers and back again to try to get super low trades. So I just get enough carrots or whatever and emeralds from the existing farming villagers that we have and then buy the books. If they're 30 emeralds, whatever. <laughs> you know, like I just, I just do it. I just do the work. <laughs> and I don't know whether that's just my age or whether it just because the, the villager trading hall has been set up for years and it's just too much of a hassle to change it again. I don't know. Like, I don't know what it is that is that mental block for me where I just don't want to get into that that level of, of um, I don't want to say finesse, but like that level of brute forcing, I guess, trading. And I know there's more efficient ways to do it. And I guess if I was spending a lot more time doing that kind of thing, I can see it in, in situations where you have a server community like hermitcraft where the server resets every year or two and you have to go through this all again i can see wanting to do it the most efficient way possible um and also create content you know as you're doing it but yeah like i just it's not something that i'm i'm super drawn to in terms of of making the trades as, as low as possible it's great if they if one or two of them happens to be low it's to me that's more the, like that's more the fun which I, again counter contradicting what i said about the enchantment rng but like if you do get a mending villager and it is a low cost to start with that's cool <laughs> you know that that's exciting that means it's going to be easier to get mending as long as that villager stays alive so um being able to just take whatever cost that mending book is and take it down to the cheapest it possibly could be it like it, it removes any kind of like winning out of that situation um i'll also give another shout out here to tim s who wrote in to vote in favor of the suggested village changes with the um idea of exploring biomes and possibly building villages in different biomes as incentive for players but also had the suggestion of a random level one trade from all librarian villagers to keep trades from being biome locked so if you found a librarian in a, a specific area it would give you a random trade at level one rather than having to find a specific biome to get mending and so it was a way in their email to level the playing field for specifically i think they mentioned mog swamp and super flat because then it removed the biome lock or had a chance to remove it i guess yeah i think that that does make sense i think it's 
allowing people the option to do both. Like, if you would rather explore, get swamp villages, and have a guarantee of mending that way without having to do all of the tedious lectern re-rolling, then that option is there for you. If you would rather stay in one place and do all of the tedious lectern re-rolling, it doesn't lock you out of getting specific trades. And so I can, I can understand the sentiment behind that. I think where Dragon Dan's email, I think, has thrown me slightly is... I think it's assuming that the only reason Mojang has started with the villager trading stuff is incentive to explore. And I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think it's a lot more about effort reward, which is a lot more abstract, I think, than just giving players reasons to explore and find other biomes and discover that there are villages and there are villagers even in the two biomes that don't have constructed villages. I think it's a lot more just about making sure that players can't have everything if they find two villages because all you need to do is breed those two villages and turn them all into librarians and then that's it. I think they like when you don't when you have like a more varied level of gameplay than just grinding everything out in one place and that is still possible if you bring back villagers to one place from biomes all over so you can still technically breed a swamp villager and a plains villager and it's a 50 50 chance whether you get one or the other and so you can still you know gather all of the villagers together in one place and breed them all together in one place to to vary your trades under the rebalance i think the the solutions being offered for keeping things fixed to one biome for the sake of super flat are often well intentioned but i think they just bypass a lot of the reasons why they want to rebalance villager trading in the first place and not only that but they they've they've found a way of rebalancing villager trades which has some subtlety to it a nuance to it in the sense that they're keeping the trades tied to potential lore reasons for why they have those trades like we've talked about how it makes sense that they have fire protection in deserts and you know swamps being the place that you get hold of mending because a swamp is not a particularly easy place to build a dwelling and so therefore they might have figured out a way to keep things from eroding and that's where the mending enchantment comes from like i think that there's some some smart thinking that goes on in the way they've distributed the villager trades that we lose the subtlety and the nuance of if you make a change that you know negates that entirely <laughs> but I, I still think there's there's room to play around here and find a balance and as we know we're, we're not certain that the actual proposed villager changes are even happening there's still no sign of them coming to 1.21 we can presume that mojang is continuing to keep those in mind but maybe wants to dedicate more of their resources to discussing other things that might be coming up uh so yeah i i, I don't know if we're really going to see an answer to the villager trading thing and things are going to stay as they are for a while um and that's a good thing for super flat players it's a good thing i think for most people and that's probably why they haven't made any of those changes more permanent is because they recognize that the version that we have right now is still preferable to the alternative they're proposing for most players and i think once we try and find a, a bit more of a a, a a balance elsewhere then maybe we can meet in the middle but i don't know when that is in the meantime that's all the time we have for this episode of The Spawn Chunks. Thank you so much for your emails, folks. You can find more information about the show and links to some of the stuff that we've talked about today at thespawnchunks.com. The music for the show is composed by me, and The Spawn Chunks is proud to be a listener-supported podcast. If you're getting some value out of the show, why not consider putting some value back in? You can visit patreon.com slash thespawnchunks to join our community, where pledging at any level gets you an invite to our patrons-only Discord chat. You can listen to the show live when we record it in Discord every week. And we also have monthly hangouts where our patrons can show us what they've been up to in Minecraft that month. We currently have 322 patrons, which is steady on from last week. There is always room for more. Special thanks go out to our content engineer patrons, Hunter555, Jumbo Sale, Mind Trip Media, Party Voyager, and Yitz. Thank you for your support on this episode. Sharing the podcast with your friends is the easiest way to support the show. You can find us at The Spawn Chunks on social media. New episodes are available on Mondays on all of the major podcasting platforms, including YouTube. You can email the show at spawnchunkmail at gmail.com, and the RSS feed is linked on the spawnchunks.com. 
the patron only rss feed is on the patreon page and that's where you can listen to the render distance the extended version of the podcast my name is Johnny, but online I go by Pixorifs. You can find most of what I do at youtube.com slash Pixorifs, where I'm currently digging a massive hole in Minecraft SOS, and the Minecraft Survival Guide is in its third season. I usually stream three days a week on Twitch, but there's potential interruption to that while my PC situation gets sorted out. Once I'm back, I will let people know through Twitter and on my YouTube community posts. In the meantime, I've also been the voice for the unofficial Hermitcraft recap, and that's still going ahead since I have a working microphone and the lungs to talk. You can find us through a quick YouTube search. As Aside from that, I'm at Pixelriffs on both Twitter and Instagram. Joel, where can people find you online? Everything that I am doing online, including the Citadel Cafe, can be found at joelduggan.com. Links to all the things are there. I'm Joel Duggan on social media and Joel Duggan on Twitch, where I stream Thursday through Sunday, currently trying to wrap up my work on Westill. Thanks for visiting the Spawn Chunks. The world outside is infinite, and we're hungry like the wolf.